Good morning. So yeah, I've been on the road for about three weeks now, and so I just hopped in uh, for two days at home. Uh, we finished up corn harvest, put up our Christmas tree. It was home for about 12 hours, just long enough to interact with my son, who stayed home sick from school yesterday. So I'm afraid maybe 24 hours later I'm picking up the same thing. But before we go too much further, uh, I, I want to get a little bit of feedback. I could talk for an hour and 15, uh, and, and I'm sure you guys would all be really obliged to, to just listen, but I don't want to do that today. So what I'd like to do, uh, I want to see a show of hands of the primary producers. Who are farmers? Okay, who is here from government? And industry. Okay, so um, I've got four main challenges that that I've kind of picked up and identified over the last couple of years that, that we need to be dealing with. And so we can come at it from two different angles. Uh, leadership on the farm, uh, and they do apply, or leadership in the industry. And in industry, I, I guess I take that as being uh, leadership on the nonprofit side, so the federation. Right, that Matt works with uh, the Young Farmer Group, which is a subset of of the of the federation. We've got the dairy farmers across the way. They're having their AGM today. So I've got my perspective, and I'll talk on those. But I want I would like to hear from from you before we get started, and we'll see kind of at the end uh, as a wrap up if we're aligned. So when you think of leadership, when you think of challenges, what floats to the surface for you, for me, for my agriculture? I would say the challenge would certainly be um, the ocean being dominated mm -hmm. um, and uh, at least for me, So limited horsepower, people power, to tackle the challenge. Yeah, I'd say your money limit is a small limit. Okay. And then we go. <coughs> Others. We got some government folks here. Pricing and distribution. Pricing and distribution. Pricing and distribution. In what respect? Dealing with economies of scale, exactly. volume. Coming in cheaper. Okay, so I was going to say to build on that, because of your isolation, shipping goods, say like your raw material, mm -hmm. like all your cutting margins, your, your cost base. And so is that a is that a food security issue? Yes. Is you can't build on that farm if you can if it's too easy to find the available farm. Right? Okay. So is a small size being true the application of agriculture and not just back to the same data that you just said? Six tractor engines, right here, and then you pull out the 
can't use the scale? Well, I guess you can't use the scale. Like it doesn't mean that it's not like one hand saying it's not enough for other things that you can do and you can just support the input to make it better. Like the power input is more than just the black bar there. It's also the other bar that you can use your hand to make it a lot more harder to make your hand more steady as you do all that stuff. You mean like Last burner. You like as a pastor to play sit in the back of the church. <laughs> and I guess we are. So, a few points about agriculture. I think that, uh, and some of this has already been articulated this morning, but you know, the traditional mixed farm in Canada is is seeing a decline. Certainly, we're seeing this across the country. And, and there's a trend towards more specialization, uh, which has created opportunities and challenges that I don't think we've yet come to terms with. But everybody's <coughs> seeking additional operating efficiency, right? Doing more with less, and, and our entire economy is being driven this way. Now, Newfoundland is unique, right? 20.2% of your farms are in that market, according to the Census of Agriculture data in 2016. Um, so again, a unique opportunity and challenge as you've just discussed, and we'll continue to discuss that throughout the day. So this value chain is something that, you know, that I speak on quite often, and it's a very important piece of what we're talking about here. Newfoundland has a unique value chain opportunity because you're small, right? But there's also that same challenge. And you had mentioned you know, the supply networks. Right, that bring us that bring us together. You know, uh, as farms have consolidated, so too has the retail sector, right? And the retail sector are getting signals from from their clients that they want different kinds of food, uh, well traced food with special attributes. Ken Shouse posted this morning in Ontario, uh, Australian Angus grass fed. And this is in Bruce County, Ontario, which is the heart of the beef sector in Ontario. So his question is, how does this, how does Australian beef grass-fed make it into a grocery store in Northern Ontario when they have an entire value chain built there on the Ontario corn fed beef program, right? But also there's a drive for consumers to have those products. So then the question becomes, how do we respond to that? Because we know that that is the trend. So now food security is increasingly discussed. And I do, I do participate in the value chain here in Newfoundland. We grow some corn over in New Brunswick and we ship some corn to, to dairy producers here on the island. And it is a challenge, right? We have got to stay ahead of their consumption because if the boats get jammed up and our truck driver sent on either side, right, our costs go up pretty rapidly. So we've got a plan, Newfoundland is very unique. <coughs> so that, again, opportunity and challenge. So thanks, Captain Obvious, we knew all that, right? So what do we do moving forward? So the challenge, and you guys have mentioned this, fewer farms. Now in Newfoundland, that trend might be different. More farms, who's got those stats? Farm numbers up? I think they are up, but it's just Right. So I, I think that, that challenge in, in Newfoundland, again, unique because you've got, well, more or less pockets of soil, 
right, where you can grow. You've got very specific areas across the island, and I guess those are centered mostly in the valleys, right? So, but overall, fewer farms, fewer people, fewer leaders to draw from in that pool. Now, out west, larger farms carrying higher risk need more attention to detail. And, and that's not unlike some of the, well, the dairy sector would be like that here in Newfoundland. We've seen, we've seen a growth uh, in the size of those operations and the number of operations. A lot of producers are really interested in accessing the dairy, but it brings with it too its own unique challenges. Right now we've got trade policy that's impacting profitability on those farms, which is very new. Right? We've got cost of inputs going up and the cost of milk isn't tracking that anymore. So they're being moved into that same operational efficiency uh, direction, right? More with less, fewer people, more attention to detail. Challenging conditions, new challenges on the horizon. Um, saw this morning, see the new UN report? Okay, 3.2 degrees warming is our new trajectory, right? We have got to reduce our emissions by five to seven percent a year, right? And they're looking at agriculture. If you've been following up the beef sector, right? Opportunity for growth, but you know, strong target, right? Agriculture is becoming a target. Uh, we have fewer people and more work to do. And we need new uh, specialized skill sets on the farm. So where do those folks come from? And again, so how do we set priorities for scant human resources? How do we prepare for communications within that value chain? So I got four unique challenges here that I want to roll through, and then we'll come back and we'll have a quick discussion at the end. So business continuance is the first challenge. So we used to refer to this as succession. A succession implies a start and a stop. And that's a challenge. We're gonna talk about change management in, in a little bit. But we use continuous, and I picked this up, you know, doing work with, with Elaine Fraze and, and and follow John Fast on this. And most business families, and notice it's not farm families, business families, and I come from an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial family, two businesses. Mom and dad, we got brothers and sisters moving through each one. So I can attest to the fact that this is not unique to agriculture. It's a family business issue. And folks think that we are entirely unique and they don't know where to go for help. Well, we know that there's lots of places to go for help these days, and this is a big topic in agriculture. Um, so that's not such a problem. The question is whether or not we take it. Now, there's two ways to look at this. Remember, we're talking about leadership, so we're talking about on the farm, but we also need to think about leadership succession at the nonprofit level. And training the leaders that are gonna take the Newfoundland agriculture forward to develop a vision, right? And enact that vision, two entirely different pieces. So why continuance and not succession, right? It's a business culture and the process never stops. And the way that I position you know, transition of, of ownership and management is that it's simply a business risk management decision, right? When you cultivate leadership in the next generation, right? That whole succession at the board table and at the farm, at the farm level. Generational coverage, right? You assume that we're gonna move these assets to the next generation. Part of the challenge we have right now is that a lot of our farms haven't taken profit out over time and tucked it away. So when it comes to the end of their career, right, and it's time to transition to the next phase in life, in a lot of cases, the only option they have and the only money that's really ever been made is the appreciation in the asset. Land values went from thousand dollars an acre to six thousand dollars an acre, right? But in order to get that out, if we hadn't taken anything else, put it over here, is to sell the land. So what happens to the next generation? We don't get a chance, right? So we need to be 
thinking about succession long term. What what is our ultimate goal? Do we have our own personal set of goals over here that we're trying to achieve, and then the business is serving those personal goals, or are we all in on the farm? Continuance allows for reinvention. And really, farmers, entrepreneurs, rarely retire. I know my father's not gonna retire, right? He built this construction business and he likes to be out there and that's kind of how he spends his time. So is it fair to ask him to move aside the stock one day so the next generation can roll in? What's he gonna do with his time, right? So if we don't allow for a reinvention and the transfer of both ownership and responsibility, then people fear that change because they don't know what the next phase in their life brings, right? So succession is starting and stopping. If you stop, I start. Transition is we work together generationally to achieve personal goals, family goals, and the business serves those goals. The challenge is a lot of our family serves the business. And when you're all in on business, when it comes time that you have to change, you have to evolve, you're not ready, and change creates fear and anxiety, which is why we see farmers, right? Which is what we don't want. So, Family business, one-on-one. Entrepreneurs highlighting the lack of downtime, about 70%. Notice it's five, another 5% higher for those that hire families. So I work with my father-in-law, and there's always this underlying tone of, well, I worked last Sunday, and you weren't here, right? So that, that extra 5% is just that little bit of extra. So, one example, a really good example, labor on the farm, he's actually your brother. He never came to work until late quarter after eight. Everybody else is there at 7.30, right? So he's the young son, and he's obviously lazy and can't get out of bed. Well, his wife had a job in town, and she had to be there for eight, but the bus didn't come until 10 after. So she put the kids on the bus, and the coffee came in. But that was never really discussed. It was never recognized that there were family goals that needed to be maintained. They need to be addressed, right? But it created animosity over here. Entrepreneurs who warn against hiring in-laws talk to my father-in-law. This is about 50%. Elaine has written an entire book on this, The In-Law Factor. I've got a little quote in there. Because it is true, it's 100% true. The in-law factor plays a heavy, heavy role in, in Canadian agriculture. Now, family firms with rules governing family members in the business, only about 10%. How do we interact as a family? And if you're planning on coming to New Brunswick next week, Dick Whitman is gonna be there on Monday for the Agriculture Excellence Conference. He's big on this, right? Whenever you bring somebody into the family, we're, we're tallying up all the all the all the credits and debits, if you will. Who gets the house? Whose truck is paid for? Who fuels up where? Who gets A for the horse? Whose cattle are housed on farm and who's down at the other ranch? Now, the interesting piece about this, 10% have written rules, but 24% have unwritten rules. So what is the problem with an unwritten rule? Fair enough. Fair enough. That's the way we've always yeah, done it. Whoever made it, if yep. they die, it's not known. Grampy, the yep. same grampy always did it, and we just, right, we never wrote it down. Subject to interpretation. Subject to interpretation, thank you. Tuesday versus Thursday. What is that unwritten rule again? Well, it's the golden rule, because whoever has the rule gets a chance to make the rules, and Thursday he doesn't think that it's going to work that way. Right? And now we've got animosity. So, small to medium-sized entrepreneurs who believe it's important to have an exit strategy, almost 100%. Those that do, 44. 
This is what I was saying just a few moments ago. We all recognize that it's important to have a strategy for the next phase in life, but we're not getting there. We're working in our businesses and not on our businesses, and that's okay until it comes down to the point that it's not, and things fall apart. And we're seeing it a lot more in Canadian agriculture out west, right, where land prices are, are, have gone through the roof, asset values have, have expanded significantly, kids are coming back, everybody wants a piece, but we never planned for it. And now we're seeing fireworks. Entrepreneurs are the chosen successor, just about a quarter. And those with an exit strategy, 57, and those have chosen a successor. So that's important, 52%, because we're gonna use the flip side of that, right? We're gonna assume that 48% of Canadian farms do not have a chosen successor. So what does that mean? 2016 Census of Agriculture said we had just over 193,000 farms in Canada. Well, 48% of those don't have a successor which means there's just under 93,000 farms in Canada that need a succession plan, need a business continuance plan. There's not enough consultants in the world to make that happen, that's only Canada, right? So what does that mean for Newfoundland? You got 407 farms, so round math, right? About 200, need a transition plan, need a continuance plan. I can only do about maybe maybe five a year, right? So it's a lot of means to do that work. But what does the banking community see? And this is what really, really got me when I started to think about this. What is the, what is the true context of this? So if you take 93,000 farms, you could use a plan, so that should be 2016. There's about 93 million acres in Canada. And I'm using an average land value there of about 750 bucks, which is probably low if you add it all up. But this includes some of the rangelands, and <coughs> even even still, we'll just go with it. 60, 33 billion dollars in assets with an uncertain future. If you take 48 percent of the total land value. Put a value of 750 bucks on it. There's 33 billion dollars worth of assets in Canada that have an uncertain future. That's 1.7 percent of Canadian GDP. First challenge we're dealing with here: Canadian agriculture, Newfoundland agriculture, business continuance. And if we again apply that to the nonprofit sector, to the federations of agriculture and the commodity groups, same thing. The work that you run with cattle producers over in the mainland, it's about a $38 million a year business. Right? Representation, that board is responsible to see the growth and development of that sector. So a $40 million portfolio, nothing to sniff at. Same thing is happening here in Newfoundland. Agriculture risky business, obviously, that, that quote, I mean, this is just, that's just the land value. We haven't included any quota in that. No buildings, no assets. And again, very much back to the napkin. But you get my point. The rapidly appreciating land values, say in Western Canada, a buddy of mine came out of, came out of school in Ivor, Saskatchewan, and, and it was a couple quarters for sale. And he, got it, he was gonna get it for the tax value. I think it's 350 bucks an acre for a lot that that land for, and the banker said, no way I'm gonna give you a loan. True, it's not gonna happen. You can't afford it, you can't pay it back. That land today is worth $2,700 an acre, and that was 12 years ago. Imagine the position that young man would be in today, equity position. Now it happened that his father had a massive heart attack not so long ago, and he took on, and, 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 and we lost him, and so he stepped up his game and, and he took it on. But what has happened with that appreciation is there's a lot of people want to come. That creates a challenge if we haven't got a, a true plan for the future on how to integrate our kids and just bringing them back because they want to come back without an assessment of how we're going to pay them is also dangerous, right? 
really nice idea to bring people back to the farm, but if you can't afford it, it creates this new financial challenge, right? That the CEO is gonna have to deal with, so that's why we need to plan. We need to plan for these things. Kids are having kids. You know, we got the next, next generation down the road. Been at this for 20 minutes? Yeah, 20, 20, 20 more 25. So we've got another 40 minutes? Yeah, I think we go to 10 30. So. I don't change my watch because I travel so much. I'm So, two pieces to consider here on transition. Do you need to own the assets to farm? Right? And a lot of what we're driven by is this ownership of, of land. We're seeing, I see it over home, you know, farmland, woodland. There's another one. Nobody ever wants to sell land, right? It's this identity that we carry with us. So as the next generation coming in, if mom and dad haven't made that plan, they haven't drawn any money out so they can retire over here and leave the assets intact. We may have to think about a different way to enter the farm and that's going to be as a management support. Do I need to have that land to own it? Absolutely. Do I need to own that land to farm it? Absolutely not. Do I really want to carry all that risk of buying that asset? Is that the smart move? Maybe not. Can I get a little piece of it? Can I work at it over time? You bet. So it's a mindset shift in how we move assets between generations. And that's why I say management versus ownership. Especially in the early days, right? Because we don't necessarily know whether or not the next generation is going to be successful in implementing their own management program, right? So if we bring them on as, as managers, they maybe build asset ownership into a compensation package that allows us to understand and evolve that relationship over time. Now one of the things you need to consider too is tax implications, right? Case in point, over in Brunswick, got this farm, big things happening, big changes coming, it's about a $4.1 million asset. There's only two people on the ownership team, I guess, of this corporation, which means we're eligible for $2 million in capital gains exemptions. Which means if we don't make a plan right, $2 million of that is subject to tax, right? So all of a sudden you wipe out a massive part of the asset value because we're not planning for it. We're not planning for that transition, and guess what? They weren't planning for what's coming next, so now they're caught. Do you want to give $2 million of your asset away? Or do you want to have something for your children, right? It's taking a long-term approach. So then, ask yourself that, that question, and, and this is to the young farmers. I'm sorry, this is for the extra generation. <laughs> Is it necessary to sell the assets to a successor? Do I have to do that? Is that the best way to get my money out? Why am I consider selling? You know, is it physical labor? You don't want the management headache? The paperwork is, is it what is a lot more than it used to be? I'm not really game for that. Something for the next generation. I want to sleep in every once in a while. This goes to their dairy guys. And I know we can grow our production efficiency, but I need help in taking the next step. So do I need a buyer for my farm or do I need a higher manager? Do I move from CEO to retired farmer or do I move from CEO to chairman of the board and bring in a professional manager team in behind to manage the assets on their own and allow me to transfer those assets over time? That's the mindset shift that we're talking about. So, 
what leadership role does the industry have to play in what I call the great succession? Remember, 93,000 farms in Canada need to come up with a, at least a plan to move through this process. So what is industry's role? What is the role of the Newfoundland Young Farmers Forum? What is the role of the Federation of Agriculture? What's the role of Farm Credit Canada? What's the role of government to support that? Lots of programs, lots of opportunities, probably not a lot of enough advisors to see it through, right? So we need to reach out to those folks. We need to be planning up front so that we're not overburdening our accountants and lawyers as time goes on. But I'm gonna leave that with you. I'm gonna leave that with you to think about, and we'll come back to it at the end here, have a, have a bit of time. So, Second challenge, leadership development. And again, I'm gonna speak interchangeably on this, but we've got leadership at the, at the farm level of the whole, right? This is your nonprofit level, right? Federation and your commodity groups, and we've also got leadership back on the farm. How many of you have read Good to Great? Nobody? Mark that down, to do, go by. Good to great, Jim Collins. So, I can't remember who it was that got me onto this. It might have been Dick Whitman. I don't think so. So what, what the book is all about, Jim Collins, and, and he's got some, some cool YouTube videos, you can check it out, he, he talks about this, a whole series of books on, on leadership and, and business management. But the book essentially found comparable companies in the same space, right? We're talking like the Procter & Gamble's of the world, Kodak, right? Some of these companies. And, and so what they found was that some found, they, they all found growth and some endured and some panicked. And so the question was, is he's at Stanford, Dr. Jim Collins, anyway, so they wanted to understand what was the difference between these companies, these Fortune 500s, that found enduring greatness or rose and, and pay, right? So they compared these companies, and they profiled them. And they started to go, you know, they went all the way up to the CEO level, and they were, it, it became a study of, let's say, leadership. What, was, what were the unique characteristics of the leadership team that allowed them to find and hold on to enduring <laughs> greatness. And it came down again to leadership. To lead people, walk beside them. As for the best leaders, the people don't know their presence. The next best, the people honor and praise. The next, people fear, and the next, people hate. So my dad falls into these three lines, depending on your perspective. There are some that revere him, but at one point they hated him, and pretty much all of them feared him. My dad was a classic baby boomer, times get tough, work harder, put in more hours, dig deep. Right? That's not what Dr. Collins found really drove great leadership. The best leaders were those that supported their people. When those, those great leaders that they found, when they went to the stage to accept the award, they brought their team with them. They insisted that their team came with them. When they stood shoulder to shoulder with them, they created an environment where the team as a whole could learn and grow and survive and excel. And that's exactly what happened. So Dr. Collins talks about level five leadership. And this is ultimately where we want to strive to be. So see five levels and all of them have 
a place in the world. Level one, highly capable individual. Perfect. Thanks for being part of the team. Love to have you on board. Contributing team member, moving up the ladder towards leadership. You got a manager in the middle, effective leader. And a lot of the good CEOs from the book found themselves in that level four area. But what, what distinguished level four and level five leadership was humility. The very best leaders, those that found the most consistent, enduring greatness were those that brought humility with them to the table. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So, we're seeking aspiring level five leaders. Now, one of the questions, I was reading through some articles last night, one of the questions from these CEOs, um, you know, they're, they're in a room and, and, and they, and one, one was, a, was a lady and she said, uh, said I was hired because I'm a tiger. I was hired for, for my ego. You know, I'm larger than life. I'm always the one in the room, right? That's why they hired me to be the CEO. And she, she asked Dr. Collins what she suggested. It was a question everybody in the room was wondering. Are you born a level five leader? Or can you become a level five leader? Can you move up the chain? His answer was yes. Now, some people have the seed of leadership plant it down deep and you cultivate that and, and it grows. Okay? Not everybody does. We get that. But we can strive to be level five leaders. So you got to know your strengths and limitations. And one thing that Dr. Collins talks about is the great leaders spend as much time thinking about their weaknesses as their strengths. So what is the opportunity there? We got a weakness in our management program. What's our opportunity? We can either build it ourselves, or we can hire it out. Be the best, hire the rest, right? Understand your strengths and weaknesses, right? And this is part of the humility piece that goes along with level five leadership. I know what I'm good at, and I'm gonna put my efforts on what I'm good at, and what I'm not good at, I'm gonna hire it out. That allows everybody to be fulfilled throughout the day. And I think part of the reason, back to succession or continuance, part of the reason that 50% of our farms do not have a transition plan is because we're really not great at it. As entrepreneurs, we're not setting out to transition a business, we're setting out to build a business, right? So that's the roadblock. That's why we need a mindset shift. And that's why level five leadership is something to aspire to, because it puts us in that in that in that space of humility where we know what needs to happen measure the success as a leader by the leadership success of your followers how are you supporting your team to be successful in their daily lives again my my dad was was that consummate leader he was always out ahead he really didn't create an opportunity for learning it was always an opportunity for being told for being taught, didn't support development, hold development. And that's not really the way that people work. Now, later in life, and you know, I've got buddies who came through high school, and you know, so we always had 15 or so young, young folk on the on the on the construction business, and a lot of them were my were my buddies, and, and they just they just couldn't even believe that I had grown up in this household. What would it be like to be be bothered by John McLeod. And you know, there were there were moments, but now, later in life, you know, they come and say, you know, those three summers we spent with Bob Construction were the best years we had. We hated it at the time, but now the skills that we've developed. But is that really the most effective way to develop leadership? I'm gonna say no. <coughs> Practice humility and take time to think about the kind of leader you want to be. So again, this comes to the importance of creating leaders for the next generation that are gonna take on some of these challenges. Thoughts? Uh, 
I think Mary Robinson is the first one to come to mind. Mary's the president of the Canadian Federation of Agriculture. Very strong, very intelligent woman from PEI. She doesn't have that option. Certainly leads with the passion. And yeah, I think I think she has the humility, uh, but also the the skill set to really inspire people. I know she inspires me. Who do you see as level five leaders in your next year? One guy from Newfoundland that I put up, I don't know if he's level five, certainly level four is Ian Richardson. You guys know Ian? Ian's a good friend of mine. Led the uh, Canadian Young Farmers Forum. You know, get to see his stuff here in Newfoundland for the dairy operators. Not everybody likes Ian. A little abrasive at times, but you know, got some things done, right? But he's a little bit like my dad, right? Could use a little bit more humility, but we could probably all use a little bit more humility. You know, that's a good question. Ken Schaus, yeah, like Ken Schaus would be an example, I think, for the Ontario beef sector, you know, very engaged. Probably level four, I think it's all over level five. No, probably would. Yeah, he's a very, very humble leader and he's, he's inspiring me with things that he's done. Yeah, so it's important to recognize those people and, and use, take their examples. Change management, pivots. How often do you guys hear that in your, in your space? My wife won't let me say pivot. She works for the Department of Tourism in New Brunswick, and it's always pivot, pivot. She's like, well, we've got this long-term strategy. We'll pivot. It drives you nuts. Change management in itself is very difficult. Why is change so hard? Fear change. So a call for role definition, right? And again, keep in mind we're talking about at the farm level, you know, the, that continuance piece. As we move from di through different phases in our life, again, my dad, you know, he started that business when he was 23, moved all the way through, had five kids, right? Brought his daughter into the fold, brought the other daughter in, right? He had to change his role. And now he's got a son-in-law with his daughter in the business, right? He's almost 70 and he loves to work, right? But he doesn't want to change. Change is very difficult for people, but it's difficult for nature. What happens when nature changes? What's the, what the, give me one, one of the best examples of change in nature. Millions of years ago. Ice age, that'll do it, right? Dinosaurs, the meteor, right? Nature doesn't change. Nature evolves. And we're hardwired to resist that change because it doesn't end well when we just change. So that's why I'm suggesting as we as opposed to pivoting, let us meander ourselves around the corner. Well, what do we need? To see that happen, to see effective change and effective evolution, we need a vision, right? We need a plan that everybody buys into. So again, nonprofits and, and farms are really not different. So we're hardwired to resist the change. If it works, why change? It's safe. We know what we're going to do when we wake up in the morning. Why would I put in robots? Why would I buy more quota? Why would I buy that new tractor? Why would I add that new enterprise? We're good where we are. Response to the prospect of change are often emotional 
are not positive. So we see anger, we see sorrow, we see depression, we see dependence, we see destructive behavior, person, when things are forced to change. So understanding the impact of all members of the management team is essential to manage that change. Now remember Darwin taught us that it was the species that were best able to adapt that survived. And so change management in the context of evolving this industry and bringing new minds and new talent to the table must be considered. So one of the pieces that's really interesting, uh, back to the good, good to great model, and how we plan for change. Planning for management in an emotionally charged environment. How do we see chain evolution happen appropriately? We involve all members of the management team. So I'm just. Sorry, Maddie. Right? <laughs> what happened, right? <laughs> Done. Presentation over. Copyright. <laughs> right. We're involving all members of the, of the team, right? And that comes from regular and effective communication. We need to listen intently. Again, developing that level five leadership. We're listening more than we're speaking. understanding others' point of view. So Daniel Goleman picked up on the work that Jim Collins had done and started to do some personality profiling of these CEOs, especially those that found that in very great ones, right? And Jim did, you know, he did fine. It, 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 was, it was the personal character traits of the CEO that allowed those, those businesses to, to exist long term. So when Daniel Goleman start taking a look at this, he's, their hypothesis was, is that those CEOs were successful because they had a higher IQ. They were smarter than the others. That's how they were able to succeed. But that's not what Dr. Goldman found. Any guesses on what the, and if you've heard me say this before, please just wait, that one personality characteristic that inherent ability possessed by the most successful business leaders today. What was that character trait? Empathy. Right. Bang on, right? They understood the importance of the youngest son on the management team showing up at 8.30 and not 7. Quarter after They understood what the impact was for him to be around and put his kids on the bus so that his wife didn't have to stress, right, and rush to her job. They understood everybody's place in the value chain and their unique contributions. This is level five leadership. Understanding how your actions impact your staff, actions, how your work at the board level impacts the industry, how we take in emotionally charged situations, how we navigate through that, how we deal with government, how we deal with our families, how we deal with governance. It all comes back to empathy. So good communication is what I'm suggesting here is a change management strategy. This will help get through the pivots, hopefully. Short and long-term goals for the business. Note family and business goals. Clearly defined core values. What is it we're in this game for? Is the family serving the business or is the business serving the family? And if the business is serving the family and there's not enough cash flow to bring that fourth or fifth or second or first son or daughter back to the farm, then we need to be very 
open and honest with ourselves, that's not going to work. Because now this family serving the business. <laughs> and it's going to bankrupt the business. What are we here for? It really hasn't worked. And all that we're going to have is some hurt feelings. So, again, creating that vision that is shared by all members of the team. Farm, industry, Newfoundland, you know, the whole the rock. What's our goal? What's our vision? How far can we take food self-sufficiency in this province? And what's it going to take to get there? What's a realistic goal, right? We need to have those conversations and really define those long-term goals. And I believe there are some documents out there, the way forward, is it way forward? It's provincial, That's yeah. still an active Yeah, they're document. still working on that, yeah. Okay, so kudos, right? You've got, you've got a plan there. Right? Is everybody engaged in that? Are we communicating effectively around that? Does everybody know what the role is in enacting the way forward? Agreed upon and written roles and responsibilities. Who does what? Who does when? Who evaluates who? How do you evaluate? How do you do a job evaluate, performance evaluation on How do you evaluate your father-in-law and his performance at the farm level? <laughs> Carefully, yeah. <laughs> but what do you need to do a performance evaluation? Measurements. You need measurements. You need to have a clearly defined set of roles and responsibilities of what it is that you are to achieve day to day when you arrive at the farm. But if you all arrive at 7.30 and you sit down at the picnic table in the shop, then you go away and you chit chat, and then you get up, you go to work, and you all look at the CEO and say, you know, so what, what, are we, what are we doing today? Right? What are we doing today? It all comes down to what's here. And if I can't read this mind, then how can I be independent? And if he steps out of the combine wrong and breaks his ankle and can't be there to do that, then how do we move forward? So we create a lot of risk. We create a lot of risk that change will be the ultimate on the farm. And remember, we don't want change. We want evolution. So we gotta have conversations. Who does what and when? And how do we do evaluations? Because what are the two pieces that go along with the, with the with a, a performance evaluation. Two sides to that. What's the first thing we think about? Oh, I got a performance evaluation. What am I worried about? Failure. Yeah. Our minds automatically go to, I'm going to be told exactly what I'm not doing right. But that's not the way to look at a performance evaluation. Because what's the other side to that? Absolutely. You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. Success here. Good work on this. Now, creating an environment for pe people to excel means that you have to give that definition. And then you do your job description based on what it is you're expecting them to do. So we need to look at performance evaluations as an opportunity for growth and development and to heap praise. Hey, kid. You did a good job. Remember that time you really stepped up and made that decision, right? You really took that on. You took that responsibility and went with it. You know, we're going to put that on your roles and responsibilities piece, and guess what you're going to get? Buck 50 an hour more. You took on that responsibility. That's now in your box, and I'm going to compensate you for that. Hey, son-in-law, appreciate what you've done for the last seven years. You know, you've grown net revenue on the farm by 40%. Here's a 15% equity share. Now, I'm the manager and ownership too. Those are the rewards, opportunities that we can have, and it can be positive as long as we're taking the time to develop those roles and responsibilities, implementing protocols and procedures to do that, and having timelines for, for, for performance evaluation. So think about that as you're, as you're, if you're here looking for ideas on how to move through the next generation on your farms, Creating that, that incentive package as it rolls through is a way to reward 
good performance. So defining a vision for the future of the ag industry. So inspiring one's co-workers with a compelling vision and mission is your number one challenge. So remember the vision statement is an outward facing statement from your business or your organization or <coughs> whoever it is you're, you're representing here today. This is what you are to your consumer. But the mission, the mission is an internal statement of what we do as a team to achieve that vision. So if we take Newfoundland agriculture as a whole, we pick the way forward as our vision. Right? Clearly defined. Now the question is, and we're here to talk about leadership, what are each one of your individual roles and or opportunities to see that vision through? What is your collective mission as Newfoundland agriculture? What does that look like? How do we break that up? <coughs> and give individual roles and responsibilities to each one of you in the room, all with the directive of achieving that. And that's what Dr. Fast says is our first challenge of any business leader. So I guess the question is, who's driving this boat? Governance is key to this. Again, everybody knows who's who in the zoo and who's doing what. So you got your vision statement, mission statement, core values. What are the core values that drive Newfoundland agriculture? What are the core values that drive you on your own farm? And do they align with the way forward? Is that, is that something you can all come to the same table with? So I would say community, family, growth, and prosperity. Right? Those are core values that each one of you share because you're all here at the table. And you're all invested in Newfoundland agriculture, Canadian agriculture as a whole. So I encourage you to think about what those core values are for you personally and how they may align with others at your table and others in the room. I want to shift just a little bit because I just got a few minutes and I want to have some conversation after this, but maintaining our social license, I'm suggesting, is probably, where are we here? Yeah, it's four, it's part of the vision. So part of that, again, that, that vision is, is the outward facing statement of what we do, say it's Canadian agriculture and Newfoundland agriculture. And you take the beef industry right now, I know this because I've worked in that sector, you know, we're feeling pretty beat up. We're feeling like our social license is eroded. Right? There's a lot of focus on the negative parts of the beef sector, right? So we're going through a performance evaluation right now, and we're not feeling too great about it. So how do we maintain a social license? What is the gap between awareness and understanding of our consumers? These things they're asking for. Well, they want black Angus grass-fed beef. So it was the president's choice brand. So I guess I gotta go to Australia to get it. Is that really the vision that we want? Is that really how we're going to achieve our consumer desires to go halfway around the world to get a product that we have right here? That social license is changing the way that we have to do things. And you know, this culture of blame is a very unfortunate piece of what we deal with. Can hardly watch the news these days. Why does somebody else respond? Somebody's doing this. Twitter has just become so angry. Right? We're really not focusing on the positive things that we can be achieving together. We're more intent on laying the blame at somebody else's feet. And I think this is a challenge with agriculture. You know. So the <coughs> actual hook back into this, when you read through Good to Grady, and I assume now you're all gonna go buy it and read it. You can't buy it on audiobooks unless you read it. <laughs> the Stockdale Paradox was something that popped up, and I won't go I won't go too deep into it, but Stockdale was a he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. 
They're shot down, spent a lot of time in this POW camp. And the Stockdale Paradox really describes those that survived their time there and those that didn't. And so those that didn't, um, you know, physical issues aside, a lot of them broke mentally. Because the Stockdale talks about it, um, they kept assuring themselves that they were going to be rescued. Calvary was coming over the hill. They'll be here by Easter. Easter came and went. Well, they'll be here by Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving came and went. They'll be here by Christmas. Came and went. And they, they literally lost their spirit because they had a broken heart. Right? But Stockdale took the viewpoint that you know, you need to retain faith you can prevail in the end regardless of the difficulty. And so he focused on making sure he stayed sharp and realistic. Still maintain faith that they were going to survive. But he tackled the challenges that were, they were facing head on day to day to day. And it's a story of perseverance and, and they did make it out. But you've got to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they may be. And I'm going to use this as an example, right? Lake Winnipeg watershed. You guys heard about Lake Winnipeg? What's happening up here? Algal blooms, right? Pretty gross. This is what the beaches look like in the summer, right? So what's causing those algal blooms? Anybody know? <coughs> Phosphorus, right? Phosphorus loading into the lake. So, if you go back and take a look, Lake Winnipeg is fed by the Assiniboine, which is fed by Saskatchewan River, and the red comes up through the Red River Valley. And they all meet right here in Winnipeg, and they dump directly into the valley, into the into Lake Winnipeg, which is here. Look at the size of that catchment. What do you see? What is this? It's the whole of Canadian, Western Canadian agriculture. So every molecule of phosphorus that comes off a field goes into that river and ends up in the lake. So who's being blamed? This is your total phosphorus levels. You see spring, it's low because we flushed, right? In the summer, it accumulates, it accumulates in the fall. And this is what your algal blooms look like. But who's taking the blame for that? What did they shut down here seven years ago in Manitoba? Hog brushes, more, complete moratorium, no new hog brushes, right? It had to be the hog brushes. Well, what do you have right here? This is Winnipeg. That's the Red River. And what do we do? What does the infrastructure look like underneath that city? Lead pipes? Lead pipes corrode over time. So what do we do to keep the lead from corroding? We load our municipal drinking water with phosphorus. We dose the water with phosphorus to keep the lead pipes from corroding. But it's the hot barn's fault that we've got phosphorus in Lake Winnipeg. And I don't have an answer to this, guys. But what I'm suggesting is how do we respond? Can we create a shared vision with our consumers? How does primary agriculture respond to that? Watch Twitter, we're gonna fight. We're gonna fight, we're gonna fight you consumers. We're gonna tell you exactly how you're wrong and why you're wrong and how you're gonna be wrong and how I'm gonna keep doing exactly what I'm doing because it's good and it's your fault, not mine. How do we respond? to our consumers. How should we? How will we? And I'm going to ask a question. Do we have a completely diverge, divergent vision for agriculture than our consumer? And if we do, then we've got a challenge that we need to address. How do we create a shared vision with our consumers? So, Few last slides. Leadership. 
on the farm, at the board level, at the association level. And we're seeing this in our young farmer members in the community, right? We're adopting this mindset, you know, moving from a, I don't know what I don't know, because really that is a blissful place to be. If I never step out of the box, if I never evaluate myself to understand my strengths and weaknesses, then I'll never have to change. I'll never have to go out and try to be better. But what I'm suggesting here is we need to move to a state of mind where I do know what I don't know, and I'm a drilling, I'm, <coughs> and I'm willing to address those weaknesses. Because that's really what Dr. Collins came up with. Now this is the hedgehog concept. And this really characterized those great leaders. And those companies that found enduring greatness, they all had a hedgehog concept. So what is, a, what is it about a hedgehog that makes it so resilient? Why is a hedgehog so tough? It's tiny, it curls up in a ball. Curls up in a ball, and it's completely impenetrable, right? Nobody can get in there. And that's where these companies found themselves. When they found this convergence of, and you've seen this triple bottom line, what are you deeply passionate about? What drives you every day? What is your economic engine? Where do you make your money? And what can you be the very best in the world at? That's your competitive advantage. What do you got as an opportunity here in Newfoundland? You're cut off from the rest of the country. That's your opportunity. Can you make money at that? That's your next question. And are you truly deeply passionate about it? I think you said this morning, it, it's, you said on the radio this morning, it's, it's passion, it's, it's part of a lifestyle. Right? It can't all be lifestyle, but that is part of our hedgehog concept as operators is that you know we're family farms and we are deeply passionate about it. Hopefully we make some money. And in Newfoundland, your question is, what are you the very best <laughs> in the world at? So again, great leaders spend as much time thinking about their weaknesses as they do your strengths, right? So as you aspire to be level five leaders here today, I encourage you to think about that. What are your strengths and weaknesses and what can you contribute? What is the role that you can play to achieving the larger, the larger vision of, of your farm and of Newfoundland agriculture as a whole? You know, again, way forward, you've got a process document to guide your efforts here. So don't, you know, don't let those documents sit on shelves, pull them off. What was it we said we were gonna do? What were our goals? And how can I apply my unique skill set to achieving those goals? Engage with a peer network. This is key, right? Building that, building that peer group. You've got one here. You know the work that the Newfoundland Young Farmers does to bring you together, right, on a regular basis is key because you'll find strength here. You'll find opportunity here. And remember, there's always two sides to that problem balance sheet. If you've got an issue. And you gotta bring it to the table. Do your homework and bring a couple of solutions with you. Don't just put the issues in the middle of the table and ask somebody else to fix them. There's two sides to the problem balance sheet. Each and every one of you have an opportunity to play on both sides. We have time. Well, I got it. Thoughts? What do we have here? Human resource pool, pricing and distribution, input costs, self-sufficiency, developing new markets, economies of scale, slaughter capacity, secondary processing. Vision for the future. Those are the challenges that you threw out as I moved to leadership. So, what is the next step?
be creating a shared vision. Shared vision. How do we engage that shared vision? Folks in government? Does that come back to this? To the problem balance sheet? Sure, yeah. Right? How often do you find yourself in a position saying, I wish we had this? Yes, or again, the blame thing, right? If we're, we're not there and it's because of these reasons versus focusing on, okay, how do we get there? But a lot of times people are bogged down blaming people as to why they didn't get there. Right. And the opportunity was probably there. Yes. And reached out and come together again role definition who does what who's who in the zoo right and, and what are we doing on, our, on a daily basis and how, how do you get people there right how do you get again how do you get people to come to these meetings to get everyone in the room together when a lot of times there's a lot of government people here but we don't see a whole lot of industry people and I guess I, I assume because they're very busy so it's hard right it's hard to get everyone together seeing a decline in engagement across the board, right? Everybody's asking the question, how do we get growers out to talk about this stuff? Right? We need to have good community engagement. So they have a problem with the community. Like the shared vision that you talked about, you have a shared dream.